Hello everybody, um, today we're here discussing the ASHRAE Energy Modeling Conference that happened last week from September 30th to October 2nd and on the Thursday there was an exciting competition called the ASHRAE Lowdown Showdown which had a number of teams competing against one another to design a zero net energy building through an energy model. So there were a number of project requirements, namely the office size, number of stories, minimum window to wall ratio. Some things were left open to interpretation, such as the design of the building itself, uh, the climate that was chosen, um, and there was a couple of trickier things in there too. So you had to include elevators, you had to include an IT room. Um, each design team had architects de designated, engineers, designers, energy modelers, and fans. And just so you know, there were presentation requirements. So uh, the presentation you're about to see will show the energy model with all design features. Um, there's a number of other pieces, so all energy end uses are shown, um, unmet load errors, the tools that were used. Some of the other requirements associated to the presentation include um, daylight maps, 3D images, and the other cool information and integration with a BIM model. So uh, we're, we've now finished the competition, it was last week, and IES won the award for best energy use results. Uh, we've had a number of people ask, to, could they see the presentation? So two of the design team members are actually gonna run through it again for us and show it to you now. So with that, I will give you team IES. Hello everyone, my name is Shona O'D. I'm with DLR Group and also presenting for Team IES is Corey from TLC Engineering for Architecture. The rest of our team include Liam from IES, Ben from ARP, Anna from Integral Group, Megan from Affiliated, Greg from EXP, and Scott from HKS. Our tool of choice for the Lowdown Showdown was IES. IES is an integrated suite of building performance software. The beauty of using IES for this competition was that we did one platform only to generate any of our results or outputs that you're going to see over the next few slides. When our team first got together, the first thing that we agreed upon was the desire to deliver a realistic and practical design. The second thing that we agreed upon was our climate location, which we selected to be Boulder, Colorado. We used a TMY15 file, which is a data set for climate that ranges between the year 2000 and 2014, which we obtained from Weather Analytics. The reason we picked Boulder, Colorado was due to the large range of climatic challenges associated with this location. For instance, the external drivable temperatures range from negative 4 to 93, and relative humidity ranges from 6% to 100%. One additional key thing that we identified was a large diurnal swing between the months of May and September, which came back to help us later on in the design process. In our initial load analysis, we forecasted a baseline EUI of 33, identified a renewable energy potential of 20, which left us with a target EUI reduction of 13 kBTU per square foot. In order to tackle this, we simulated a range of different geometrical options. Here are some of them. And this was to identify how we could create a building that was also climate responsive in the location that we had picked. This is the final geometrical model that we were left with. And now I'd like to give you a 60 second virtual tour of this architectural model. To satisfy the renewables, we have PVT panels and five wind turbines associated with the building. Some of the ECMs that we included are a draft lobby to reduce infiltration, an airflow integrated atrium, and a high performance facade that minimizes solar heat gain during the summer months. We have a sawtooth facade that captures predominant westerly winds, while also featuring heat mirror glazing, R50 insulated panel, and operable louvers. While inside the building, we have ENERGY STAR equipment, exposed thermal mass at high level and radiant floor at low level. 
skylights assist with daylight harvesting and operable windows allow for natural ventilation. Our atrium funnels westerly winds towards the wind turbines, while a shadow plan office features dynamic shading and blinds on the east and west facades. We also have a passive evaporative downdraft cool tower to assist with cooling during the summer months. In order to understand how our building was affected by the urban environment that surrounds it, we performed a series of solar shading analysis. We also performed solar radiation analysis to identify the optimum location for our shading, in addition to our renewable panels on the roof. All this was done by the power of the cloud. And now for our renewables. So we designed 16,500 square foot of PVC panels into our building. These generated electricity, but also generated heat. This heat was incorporated into the hot water loop of our mechanical systems in order to improve the overall efficiency of the PVC panels themselves. We also incorporated wind turbines and simulated the actual performance of this product by incorporating the power curve of the actual wind turbines into our model. We performed some external CFD analysis and forecasted that there would be an increase of three feet per second being funneled into the wind turbine, but this was not incorporated into the overall electrical performance of our turbines in the model. Now for some of our ECM, we created a south face we created um, a shading design for our south facing uh, facade by analyzing uh, the depth that would be required to shade the glazing during the cooling season while also taking advantage of passive solar heat gain during the summer months. We also have dynamic shades on the east and west facade. These were designed by analyzing the balance points of the building and then determining when the shades would need to engage during um, hot portions and cold portions of the year. When we did our initial load analysis, we identified the envelope as the main source of um, the load in the building, the highest contributor of this envelope load was due to external glazing. In order to tackle this, we ran a slew of different parametric simulations to determine what our optimum envelope selections would be. We resulted in a R60 roof and R40 wall and low E krypton filled heat mirror glazing. This was facilitated by uh, the heat mirror glazing by Eastman, the insulated panels by Kingspan, and we also had dynamic shades by some feet. This ended up reducing the overall contribution of the envelope to the total load of the building. We also performed a full lighting design by doing a room by room analysis. We incorporated Bagger holds lighting, and we're able to reduce the overall lighting power density of the building by ensuring that the lighting design that we had created satisfied industry standard lighting thresholds. We also analyzed this lighting design with respect to glare by performing a room by room glare analysis that proved that we would not sacrifice visual comfort through this reduced lighting power density. And to continue with the remainder of the ECMs, we incorporated actual metered data from an energy conscious office at Integral Group as our lighting and plug profiles replacing the generic 90.1 schedules. This metered data was linked in as a freeform profile. And as you can see on the left, we have a comparison between our metered plug profile to the 90.1 user guide profile and there are significant deviations that are going to cause us to have 
not only a reduced amount of energy consumption, but also reducing that subsequent heat gain associated with the plug loads. Anywhere that's highlighted in yellow is at least a 15% deviation compared to the 90.1 schedule. Here on the right, we have the lighting profile compared with the 90.1, and once again, you can see significant deviations here, even larger than what we saw uh, for the plug loads. Um, however, this does take into account the results of uh, daylight harvesting. Once all other ECMs were exhausted, uh, instead of going straight to uh, some sort of high efficiency cooling system, we opened the windows of our building to see how much of the load we could satisfy using natural ventilation. However, um, after running a whole bunch of simulations, we were still overheating a bit. Um, so in order to mitigate that, we decided to relocate the plug load associated with printer stations and coffee stations uh, to the north office areas, which were lower load uh, zones, basically moving the heat to where we need it, which reducing our peak cooling load in zones and reducing our peak heating load in those north zones. Um, we also incorporated uh, then uh, a night purge taking advantage of that summertime diurnal swing and further uh, making that work well by exposing the thermal mass of our internal constructions. Uh, now, looking at a typical unmet hours test doesn't make a lot of sense for a natural ventilation strategy. So we decided to employ the adaptive comfort metric, which says that uh, none of our offices can be above 77 degrees operative temperature for more than 5% of the occupied hours, and that no offices can be above 82 degrees for more than 1% of the occupied hours. And as you see here, that once we incorporated all of this and optimize our natural ventilation strategy, we meet those thresholds uh, for adaptive thermal comfort. Uh, once again, to show that we're meeting those uh, thermal comfort criteria, you can see our model uh, just the office areas colored by operative temperature here and then it'll animate through a full 24-hour day so you can see uh, how it changes throughout uh, the day on a, on a typical design day. Um, here on the right you have comparison of the outdoor air dry bulb temperature to the operative temperature in our spaces showing why that night purge uh, is so effective and how that we can discharge the thermal mass to uh, help with cooling during the day. And finally, uh, we have our model here colored using percentage people dissatisfied. Um, as you can see, we never get above 20% dissatisfied, and even when it gets up to 20%, it's only for an hour or two before coming back down. So on this slide, you can see our natural ventilation strategy in action. The red arrows indicate bulk airflow transfer between zones. Um, and in the top right of the atrium, you can see the blue arrow indicating air being sucked out of our negatively pressurized outlet. Um, and also, the zones on the left are colored by operative temperature, so which, as you see, as you go up in the atrium, the colors get hotter, indicating the stack effect, once again, helping to induce that air uh, through the offices and up and out of the atrium. And on the right-hand side, it's the same condition, but colored using percentage people dissatisfy, showing that um, the only, really, the top zone of the atrium is, is getting really hot where it's not actually occupied. We did an external CFD to, once again, show that negative pressure zone uh, that's helping to suck the air out of our atrium. Um, and here we have two CFDs to show a little more detail of our natural ventilation strategy in action. The left is the velocity vectors uh, coming across the atrium, and the right is the air temperature. So on the left, you can see how the air is induced up and out of the atrium, whereas on the right you can see that the temperature of that air really doesn't affect the occupied area, so still keeping it comfortable uh, for occupants in the atrium while it's being exhausted out. 
So um, give a rundown of the HVAC systems that we did end up with. So we have a radiant floor system and a DOAS that preheats outside air in the winter time whenever our windows are shut. Um, and this single loop also serves our hot water, our domestic hot water. Uh, all of that heating is done using an air to water heat pump that's then supplemented by heat from our uh, PVT panels. The only mechanical cooling that we have is in that IT room using a high efficiency uh, server cooler. And our DOAS has an enthalpy wheel that uh, helps to take load off of our hot water loop by preheating the air, uh, as you can see here on the psychrometric chart. Uh, a few uh, peak equipment sizing. Uh, remember, we have zero kb per hour of mechanical cooling uh, for our office spaces. Uh, the only mechanical cooling is the 16 kb per hour uh, for that high efficiency server cooler. And then our air to water heat pump is uh, 595 kbg per hour, uh, then supplemented uh, by heat from the solar thermal panels so that it doesn't have to run at, at full load. Um, and you can see the 3D graphs of our heat outputs uh, down at the bottom from both the solar panel and uh, the air to water heat pump to our hot water loop. So how did we come out compared to a 90.1-2010 baseline? Well, before renewables were taken into account, we have 77% energy savings compared to the 90.1-2010 baseline. With the renewable energy generation taken into account, we're at 108% energy savings. Here's a reduced storyboard of the ECMs we incorporated into our design. You may notice that uh, the VRF option and the radiant heating option are very close uh, from an energy standpoint. Uh, but we decided to go with the radiant heating because it results in higher thermal comfort uh, for the occupants. And we wanted our building to not just be net zero or positive, but comfortable as well. And so you can see that we've achieved being positive by getting to a negative 2.6 kbtu per square foot per year. Uh, here's looking further at how our offices perform with our natural ventilation strategy. Uh, it's our two main conditions here with the summer condition on the left and the spring fall on the right. In the summer we have warm air that enters the windows, rises, and mixes the space. Uh, whereas in the spring fall, cool air falls and is induced across the space, but the radiant floor keeps it warm enough uh, to mitigate any possible drafts at ankles. So we didn't want to design a building that's just going to be net zero next year. We want to design a building that was going to be net zero uh, for years to come. So we took our uh, TMY15 weather file and used WeatherShift to morph it 50 years in the future. Uh, so what happened? Well, our EUI actually improved. And we were a bit puzzled uh, with this at first. But then we realized that the only climate responsive mechanical equipment that we have is heating equipment. And in this weather file, uh, there are less heating hours than um, there were in our previous weather file. So the energy for our heating decreased, but now our NatVent strategy uh, isn't quite cutting it. We're, we're out of those adaptive thermal comfort ranges. So we needed to come up with something that would uh, allow us to bring more cooling into the spaces, but without using a lot of energy so as to um, make us not be net zero anymore. The solution we came up with there was passive downdraft cool towers. So we closed our windows and engaged the cool towers, which capture uh, the wind that then goes into a spray chamber, which adds both moisture and reduces temperature, causing it to then fall down the cool tower and into our occupied zones, providing you know cooling effect that's then induced across our offices up and out our atrium. Uh, 
and as you can see, uh, once again, we have our model colored by operative temperature, and we're back within adaptive comfort thresholds. Uh, a few of those project requirements, the, we've got our uh, monthly peak demand and energy end use, um, and the monthly uh, energy use here. We also were able to integrate uh, by exporting our model to uh, Autodesk Revit and also import uh, the ver vertical axis wind turbines from Trimble SketchUp's 3D warehouse. As far as innovative workflow goes, we utilize the IESV navigators uh, to create our uh, model and our 90.1-2010 baseline. And as you can see, uh, it allows us to track who did what and when uh, based on when the boxes were checked here in this navigator. Um, and also, the program being broken up into different applications allowed us to be able to perform multiple tasks in parallel and then bring them together into a central model that um, then we knew what everyone had done. All right, so now I guess we're ready for any questions. That was great, you guys. Really good. Um, so I'd collected some questions from the conference that I just wanted to repeat so, so people could see what sort of um, other queries people had. And I guess when we post it, we can, we can take more questions uh, as time goes on, too. So uh, one of the first questions was, um, what was the one single integral innovative feature of the project? Oh, I can take that one. Uh, that would be our atrium, uh, because the atrium allows for the air to not only be induced from the office spaces um, and then uh, cause a stack effect to uh, exhaust it back out, uh, but the geometry of it uh, with the westerly wind um, funnels air to our wind turbines, and we've also uh, have that negative pressure region at the outlet that causes the air to literally be sucked out. Very nice. Thanks, Corey. Um, next, next question is, can you please detail the renewables that were modeled and how much of an EY did that provide? Sure, I can take that one. So we incorporated 16,500 square foot of PVT panels. So these panels not only generated electricity, but also generated heat that was incorporated into our uh, hot water loop. And additionally, we have five vertical axis wind turbines that um, are incorporated into the building. Great, thanks, Jonah. So it seemed, Corey, from one of the slides that you show that the, the VRF option um, may have actually been performing slightly better than the radiant floor. Is that right? And if so, um, can you discuss a little bit more what the logic of choosing the, the radiant floor against the VRF option? Right, yeah, th those are definitely really close uh, energy use wise. And really, it, it just came down to the fact that uh, we felt like the radiant floors gave us uh, better thermal comfort in the design and, and also really allowed us to take advantage of the low return water temperatures that we get uh, from having a, a solar thermal system built into our PVT panels. Very good. Um, next question is, oh yeah, so the, the atrium funneling air towards those wind turbines, I noted that you didn't account for that in the energy model nor did you account for an ECM shown here called elevator shaming, where you've got these bike racks nicely positioned beside this uh, all-glass stair core beside those elevators. Uh, can you speak to why those particular energy conservation measures were not modeled? Sure, I can take that one. So as we said at the start of the presentation, we wanted a realistic and practical model, but we also wanted to be conservative. We proved that both of these concepts are realistic in the sense of we did perform an in-depth CFD analysis to prove that there would be an increased wind speed towards the wind turbines, but we wanted to be conservative in the performance data of the turbines. Similarly, uh, numerous studies have proven that 
having an elevator in a specific area will reduce the usage, but we wanted to, to be conservative with this measure and the overall energy usage to actually meet our energy goals. Very good, Shona. And, and while I have you on that one, Shona, can you speak to the effects of you know real urban design uh, being considered with, with that wind funneling towards those, those wind turbines? Sure. So when we were designing our building, we also looked at a site. So we looked at a, a specific location in downtown Boulder where there will be similar building types and then built up that entire section of the city. So what we did was use open street maps and import the data from OpenStreetMap map into the VE, and then we're able to input our building onto the site location that we wanted. We picked the site location with uh, two driving requirements, and that was to have a relatively open uh, plan on the west and south facades in order to facilitate natural ventilation. So once we had the building and the, in the right site and we had built up the entire uh, geometry of the site in the VE, we were able to perform shading analysis to determine how each one of the adjacent buildings would affect our building in addition to uh, large-scale external CFD to determine how surrounding buildings might affect the westerly winds coming into the turbine. Very good. Um, seeing some of the extremities associated with Boulder, can you tell us why did you pick Boulder? So we wanted to pick a climate that had necessary challenges that could um, challenge the group. The okay. group have operate in large in a large range of different climate locations, and this was the climate that we thought was challenging enough to uh, create some innovative solutions. Very good. Not often you get to work on heating systems, Corey. I don't imagine. No, not not a whole lot. <laughs> cool. Um, and maybe last question then is, uh, did you guys consider using any other alternative software tools to potentially integrate with this or for the reasons of potential workarounds that, you, you know, something you could not do? You know, we, we really just wanted to stick with what we could model explicitly within the one software. Um, that way that we weren't incorporating any side calculations that could, um, you know, hurt our accuracy um, and once again, really keeping to make sure that we could satisfy our goals. Great, great. Um, so let me say it was a pleasure working with you guys for the last 10 weeks or so. Appreciate it. Um, I think we can get this one posted up soon. And, and uh, if we put it up on the YouTube channel, people should be able to ask questions. And I guess we can all try and keep an eye on it so we can uh, address those questions when they come in and hopefully add answers. Appreciate it. Sounds good.